Well, welcome. I'm so Thank excited you. to see you. We have all missed you. So we're very happy that you have this book because, guys, I read this in a night. <laughs> if you are a Bachelor or a Bachelorette fan, you have to get up this book for Memorial Day weekend because it's a perfect Quick read. read. Don't worry. Um, but tell me, what made you want to write this this book? It's kind of like a self-help tell-all. Um, yeah, it's kind of like an anti-self-help. Um, <laughs> that's, that's how I categorize it. If you read it, you would understand. Uh, there, it's basically everything you're not supposed to do in a breakup, but that you do. So it kind of gives you that permission. But the reason I wrote the book really um, kind of came unintentionally. If you, if you see like every single page in there, it starts with a story. So it's all journal entries. Um, it was everything that I went through during a breakup. So day one, I literally had come out of a nine-month engagement. It was very, very public, but it hadn't hit the air yet. And I didn't know who to talk to, who to trust, what to say. So I got a piece of paper and a pen and just started writing. Um, everything that came to my mind that day, emotional, irrational, psychotic, <laughs> um, went down on the paper. And day after day, I started to kind of see a little progression, a little digression sometimes, and just kind of decided like, all right, this is the real story of what happens after the camera's cut and what goes on during a breakup. The same thing that the girl next door to me or a coworker is experiencing but never talks about. So I would say the book was definitely unintentional, but then we decided to kind of break that fourth wall and talk to the readers and give some advice and a little of the hindsight information, kind of like a what I wish I knew then, but <laughs> No, now I guess. Yeah. And so uh, your bachelor journey started out how many years ago now? Oh my gosh, I think it's been like over two years. Wow, it's wild. Yeah. So you go through your audition. Um, maybe explain it to the crowd a little bit. <laughs> how you first got hooked into this, going to this audition in Atlanta that you didn't really want to. Although it wasn't an audition, it was more yeah, like a casting, a casting call. call. Everyone always asks me, um, "What made you go to the casting call in the first place?" And I say two words: free drinks. <laughs> And it is so true. So I had some girlfriends, and I'm from the South, and I was 26, which meant everyone was either married or engaged or, you know, about to be engaged. And I had some single girlfriends, and they're like, you should go on a reality dating show. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, who are you? Do you know who I am? There's no way I'm doing that. And they just kept prodding and kept telling me, go on the show, go on the show, there's a casting call. So we went literally for weeks of these group chats with them trying to get me to go. Um, and finally, one of my girlfriends was like, well, there's free drinks. <laughs> and I paused and I go, wait, why didn't you say that in the first place? <laughs> we could have saved ourselves like weeks of debating. And so I remember I was a DA at the time. I was a prosecutor in Atlanta. And um, I had gone that day, I was, I was prosecuting gang crimes, which meant I was literally in the hood of Atlanta every single day. And I had gone from the hood that day to getting off work and going to the casting call of a reality dating show. And I'll never forget, I uh, was in my suit. I had a skirt suit on, because it was like summer. And I got there and I see all these girls lined up and they're all in like nice dresses with high heels and they're done up. And I look in the rear view mirror and I'm just like, oh shit. <laughs> I looked down, I'm like, what was I thinking? But um, I ended up doing the first casting call having no idea what to expect. And then next thing I knew, I was on a second casting call being flown to LA. And all of that was kind of a blur to me because the very next thing I knew, I was packing to go to LA for the first time and be in the Bachelor Mansion. Yeah. And tell me about packing because <laughs> all of your outfits on the show are incredible. Every girl looks great, but yeah. I heard that it's all your own clothes, unless yeah. you're the bachelorette. Yeah, so the first season, the setup obviously is there's anywhere from like 25 to 30 women competing for one man. Yeah, crazy, I know. <laughs> but um, they give you this packing list. You have no idea how long you're going to be there. You have no idea where you're going. And this packing list says, pack for the following. And it's like, warm weather cold weather, dressy nights, athletic wear, and then at the bottom it says, in two suitcases. So you're trying to think, okay, how am I gonna basically pack my life up to nine weeks in two suitcases? And I should have started packing earlier. I said this in the book, it was like, I started that weekend and was in a total tailspin. But um, yeah, they basically have you pack for everything and you have no idea what you're about to embark on. Crazy. Yeah. And so when you went into the show, did you think that you would come out um, you know, in love or were you more there for the experience, meeting new girls, traveling? Um, yeah. Because I know you refer to him as number one in the book. Yes. 
But of course, it was Juan Pablo. Yes, not the one. Um, a little bit of both, and I guess everything. So the first season, I will say, I was very, very naive. I had never seen the show before. I knew what it was. I didn't live under a rock, so I was well aware of what the franchise was. Um, but the guy was hot. Sorry, Dad. Um, he was good looking, and I was like, you know what, I'll see. Maybe I could find love, but I knew I was going to at least have a vacation. And I kind of ch chalked it up to like, all right, two weeks of paid vacation, like why not? Um, had gotten permission from my bosses and everything, and maybe I'd travel some cool places, maybe I'd meet some cool people, maybe I'd fall in love. Um, and then cut to like seven weeks later, and I show back up at work, and I'm like, Sorry, I didn't know I was going to be gone so long. Um, but I had minimal expectations the first season, I will say that. And what was your experience like that first season? Um, you know, you did sort of fall for the guy, but in the end you realized quickly that he wasn't the one. Yeah, I mean, for starters, I was very naive going into the first season. I didn't come from a, a family of entertainment. Um, I was, again, I was a prosecutor like in Atlanta, Georgia. I had no business being on a reality TV show. I had no idea what to expect. So I came in very, very naive. Um, but I stayed. I liked the guy. You know, it was kind of one of those situations where I think one guy with 25 to 30 women vying for him gives him this little aura, and you're like... All right, he's he's good looking, I guess. Everyone else wants him. Like, it kind of ups his his game a little bit. But you know, in the end, I think I figured out when it got closer to to finishing um, that there was not love there, and not not that it was a waste of time, but it was kind of a realization of all right, this isn't going to work out. And like any relationship, you say you kind of know when you hit that point, and there's the point of no return. And it's like all right, this isn't going to work out. It's over, done. Like kind of time to pack it up and move on. And you walked away with a ton of new girlfriends, a lot of them who are featured in your book. I did. That's the funny thing. People always say, how could you be friends with a girl that dated the same guy as you did? And I always say, well, first of all, we have to put dating in quotes because <laughs> this guy is dating 30 women. Um, but I also say, I'm like, you throw girl code out the door the second you walk into the mansion. Like, you're all dating the same person. You can't get mad at your friend that you've met for five minutes for, like, making out with the same guy that you've known for five minutes. Um, but it's funny also because you spend so much more time with the actual contestants rather than the lead. You know, you go on one date a week with the lead. The other six days, you're in the house with these same girls day in and day out. You're sleeping in bunk beds with them. So you start to develop a, a much stronger friendship with them and a much stronger relationship than you do with the lead. And when you were watching the show back, that first season you were on, oh, um, but did you realize you had such a big fan base? So many people loved you, and they loved you for standing up for yourself um, in that final, you know, moment after the fantasy suite. Yeah. Um, did you realize that you would kind of have this effect, and then eventually become the Bachelorette? I didn't. Um, again, I think it was kind of having that mindset of just being so naive to what it all was. Um, but yeah, it, I appreciated the fact that women especially kind of rallied around, I guess, my exit of being, I don't know if you would say powerful or feministic in a way, but basically, you know, it was a situation where I didn't feel respected in my personal and emotional and intellectual space. And it, I was in this situation where it was all about the guy, all about the guy, all about the guy, and it took me a second to realize, wait a second, just because there's 30 women and one guy doesn't mean this isn't a two-way street. It doesn't mean that we as women, you know, are in any way uh, underneath this guy who can just do whatever he wants and basically not care in a sense. Like we have feelings, we have time, and it's a two-way street. And so I think people appreciated that. I appreciated that people picked up on that because I think that's everyday life. That was the biggest thing for me was any woman who doesn't feel like a guy is respecting her or even into her, caring for her whatsoever, would walk away and leave, but you don't usually see that on reality television, so I hear. Um, so I was glad that people kind of were able to take that real life and see it in reality TV as well. And so what were your thoughts when the producers came to you and said, we want you to be The Bachelorette? Were you scared? <laughs> were you excited? Um, I was like, hell no. <laughs> Been there, done that. Um, you know, I mean, at first I was like, absolutely not. Like, I'm good. Uh, but the more I thought about it and the more single I was, I was like, all right, I mean, 
25 guys. Like, I, d I had a good experience the first time. It didn't work out with the guy, but I also could see how it could work out. And I know that sounds crazy. How do you fall in love in like eight weeks on a reality TV show? But I have friends that literally have fallen in love in a week with a guy they met drunk at a bar. I mean, let's be honest. We all know those people or like a coffee shop or you see a guy or a girl walking down 7th Avenue. Like it happens in the craziest of ways. And so I think I saw kind of that glimmer of hope that it could happen, that this wasn't such a crazy idea. And I was like, all right, 25 guys. Like, what do I have to lose? I'm already single, you know? And that first night, um, of course, you had an instant connection with the guy you ended up uh, becoming engaged to, Josh. Yes. Um, and then tell me about, you know, you had Nick and Chris Souls as well, who are both still kind of in this bachelor world. Yeah. Um, you can't get any of us out of it. <laughs> were there any other guys that you wish maybe you gave a little more time to now when you look back? Or do you, um, are you confident with your choice? You know, I think, first of all, a lot of the guys had a lot more time than you saw. That's another thing, like these dates go anywhere from eight to 14 hours, and you as a viewer see four to eight minutes of it. So, you know, obviously the more dramatic guys get more airtime, um, but somebody like Marcus. Marcus, the first night, I was like, I mean, is this the lighting? Am I buzzed? Like, who is this that just walked out of the limo, you know? So he was a guy that I actually spent a lot of time with, but you didn't see as much airtime with him because he was a little more subtle. Um, but yeah, if I had to do it all over again, I really think the order in which the guys went home would have been exactly the same. And maybe that's just because I um, spent more time than the viewers saw yeah. with each guy. And so in the end, you got engaged. I did. Um, everything seemed to be working out perfectly. But as we know, after the cameras stop rolling, um, you know, it kind of changes. It changes yeah. the dynamic and everything like that. So tell us a little bit, and I know a lot of it's in the book. Yeah but how that was the first few weeks where there were no cameras, you guys were alone. The first few weeks were great. Actually, the first few months, I was kind of um, expecting like a little morning after, you know, where you're like, oh God, that this wasn't real or what, what was I thinking? Um, but honestly, when the cameras cut and we were engaged, everyone packed up and went home. And for the first like few months, it was very blissful. Like, I wasn't expecting that, but we were still kind of in that honeymoon phase. And did you tell uh, Josh about this book and give him a little bit of a warning? I didn't. You know stuff? what, though? Here's the thing. I think, first of all, it's like... <laughs> There's some good stuff in here, guys. Well, first of all, I mean, who really like wants to talk to their exes? Not a lot of us keep in touch with their exes, let's no. be honest. So he still is my ex. Just because he's in a, a character in a book doesn't negate the fact that he's an ex. But, you know, I think you can see a lot of my exes have since gone on to kind of do other things, whether it's like... Chris Sewell is doing The Bachelor, Nick doing The Bachelorette, or Josh doing whatever he's doing. Like, we all have decided to live our private lives very publicly, and everyone kind of gets that choice. And I don't think any of us need to ask permission. Like, we're exes, you know? Like, do you ask your ex, like, permission to do something? No, you're, you don't have to do that. He doesn't need permission from me for anything. None of us do. Yeah. Was there one secret in this book that you were nervous about writing about and getting out into the world? Or were you kind of just like, whatever, I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna yeah. do it big? One, talking about, there's like every page has a secret. I was like, oh God. Um, no, there was a lot of stuff that I was really reluctant to write about. I mean, it's emotional, it's very raw. It's, like I said, at times irrational. But when I wrote the book, when I decided to write the book, I said, all right, if I'm gonna do this, I'm just gonna go for it. I'm gonna go 100%. I'm not gonna like go back in my journal entries and erase moments and try and make myself look better, sugarcoat anything, um, because I think the transparency was really important for me. Like for readers to really have that transparency and be able to relate to the story and not be a reader who looks at the author and says, wait, this girl has no idea what a breakup really is. Um, that was important, so for me that meant everything that I wrote kind of went in, yeah. for better or worse. <laughs> I mean, there were some pages when I was like, I can't believe this happened, and we didn't know it, because, no. of course, the tabloids and the gossip and all yeah. of that. Did that weigh on you a lot after the show, and were you constantly, like, Googling yourself or checking what people were saying, or were you kind of, you know, aware that you should stay off the Internet and oh, yeah. stay out of the aisles of supermarkets? And 
I learned very quickly to stay off the internet. Um, I learned very quickly not to Google myself. First of all, it's such a narcissistic thing to do if you think about it. But also, it's like setting yourself up for punishment. Like, nobody's really nice on the internet anymore, so why, why are you setting yourself up for that? But there was that pressure, for sure. And I always say, the pressure that I had on the, the success of the relationship was obviously a little elevated because, like you said, it's in the tabloids, it's on the internet, but it really is no different than anyone else's because let's say you're dating someone for 10 years and your family thus has spent 10 holidays with them. There is that added pressure. Like when you break up with them or when it doesn't work out, like your family hurts and they're losing someone too. And I think everyone feels a sense of pressure in every relationship regardless of, you know, whether it's the length of time or you know, trying to prove the world wrong by getting engaged after eight weeks on reality television. Um, whatever it is, there is that sense of pressure. And I think that kept me in the relationship probably longer than I should have. Yeah. And you mentioned, of course, your other ex, Nick, um, who kind of, he didn't steal the spotlight per se at the after the final rose. Oh, but there was it. a Let's be honest. Yeah. Let's give the guy credit. He there, there was a big revelation uh, that happened that you weren't aware was going to happen. Yeah. And it kind of caused this spiral. Um, can you take yourself back to that time and sort of reflect now, a few years later? Yeah. Um, so obviously the live after the finale, um, after the final rose finale, Nick decided to divulge some intimate information. Um, and I was clearly blindsided. Um, but looking back, it's kind of one of those things that, this is going to be crazy to say, but I'm glad he did it. And here's why. Because it got us talking about slut shaming, and it got us talking about sexism, and I don't think a lot of reality TV shows have been able to do that. I don't think that was his intention. I'm not giving him credit for that. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> um, <laughs> he unintentionally kind of opened this door, and I talked to Caitlin Bristow about it a lot, and it's kind of one of those things where we now have this conversation about not only sex, but slut shaming and feminism and women being powerful, not just in everyday life, but in reality TV. And it was kind of like if I had to be um, the punching bag for that conversation to reveal itself, then I'll take it every day. Because now you see how much, yeah, let's give a round of applause <laughs> for that. You see how much the show has changed. Yeah, you do. Um, especially with Caitlin Bristow's season, as you were saying. She let everything out. She yeah. didn't care what people thought of her. Because as you say in your book, too, you're women and they're men. And what happens when men and women are in love, guys? And there's a fantasy suite. Right, and people didn't understand. <laughs> yeah, there's no cameras. People also didn't understand, like, I have been dating these guys for two months almost. And, like... I'd met these guys' families, I'd been to their hometowns, we'd been on dates, they'd professed their love to me. Like, we had moved on to the, the stage of, in my opinion, you know, the stage of intimacy at that point. Like, any woman in real life would have already been at that phase. And it's funny because every guy on the show that's the lead, you never hear about the fantasy suite. It's kind of like we give women this platform to, oh, finally be able to pick between 25 men, and it's powerful, and it's giving us a leg up in a sense, but like we take it away from them just as quickly when we kind of shame them for doing the same things the men do as far as intimacy. It's like dating right after the show. I'm sure if you started dating after your breakup, it would have been such a big deal where compared to right. the guy, right. people don't care. Right, but like no one cares if a stranger has a one night stand. Yeah. But like God forbid a 27 year old woman like looking for her husband dates someone for two months, you know. So it's, it's interesting. I'm glad that it brought, it brought up the issue to be honest. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I think it's, it should be an open dialogue. Like I'm glad, it kind, of, it kind of solidifies the fact that like we as women can not only date 25 men at the same time, but like we can date them the way men date women too. Yes, I totally agree. I'm so and there's my feminist rant. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to a close. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> now, um, tell us your tips for getting through a breakup. Kind of summarize it. Um, what did you learn from this breakup in particular? Especially, you know, part of it was in the spotlight and part of it wasn't. Yeah. So there, there's a tricky thing there. Oh my god, where do I start? I mean, first of all, the number one tip is wine. Like, don't even, don't even try to deny that, like, you just need some wine. And indulge in whatever you want for a period of time. You get a hall pass. Um, but I think to actually, like, feel the emotions that come along with heartbreak. And I know that sounds ironic, but if you just skip over those painful emotions, I don't think you ever really experience that heartbreak and you can ever recover from it. Like you almost have to be down in the trenches to know what like life after really looks like. Um, but there's a lot of things, you know, like 
lean on your family and friends. Um, the, that was one of the biggest things in my life was my family and friends, the support of them. Like, I was pathetic. I, I didn't get out of bed for two weeks, you know? Like, if I had been alone in all of it, I don't know what I would have done. And that, in turn, has kind of made me a better friend and a better family member. You know, you always have those times when, like, your mom calls, hi, mom, at the worst time, and you're like, I really don't want to talk to her right now. It's, like, the worst time ever. But, like, I saw how much my mom was there for me whenever I needed her, and it makes me just, like, pick up that phone and be like, you know what, I need to be that same person in return. And so with the new season of The Bachelorette, are you going to be watching it? Have you given JoJo any tips? And I want to hear your maybe top four. Oh my gosh. Um, yes, I will be watching it. So I never watched the show before. Now I'm totally addicted. I'm like in, I'm in the Bachelor Nation, I feel like. Um, so yeah, I watch it. The first episode was insane. I, every year it tops itself. Like this year did not disappoint. It's a circus. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot more drunk guys than usual on this yes. season. This season I feel like that was the theme this but first. Some of them stayed, which I'm like, if you well, were drunk the first night you met me, get yeah. the hell out. That's then she'd I have mean. no one left, though. <laughs> She'd have like six people left. <laughs> so it's like, let's let's do like a sobriety test and like the drunkest ten go. Get out of the pool. Yeah. <laughs> you five are saved. Yeah. Um, but no, I love watching it. My advice for JoJo is just like try and enjoy the experience. And I know that sounds kind of simple, but um, you get really wrapped up. You get wrapped up in the fact that there's cameras and that you're dating 25 people and there's dates and tears and manipulation that you feel like coming from you know cast members and you have no idea and you get really wrapped up in what is an incredible experience. I mean, I saw the world like I will never see it again. I did things and I had no business doing. Like, I have no talent. I don't deserve to, like, do half the things that I got to do. So um, just kind of soak it in. It goes by really fast. And would you ever consider going back on The Bachelorette or The Bachelor or Bachelor Pad, for that matter? No. I wouldn't, and not out of bitterness at all. I actually had a great experience. It's kind of like the opposite. It's kind of, I don't really want to sour the experience that I had. And plus, it's like, I think two stints is plenty. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't do a second, so I'm going to swear that I don't do a third. <laughs> and before I pass it off to the audience, um, what's going on now in your dating life? And you live in New York. <laughs> Are you having fun? Have you met anybody uh, special? Um, I'm having fun. I date around in New York. It's great. Like being single in New York's amazing. Um, I feel like I had like a record dating spree there for a little bit. So I'm, I'm slow to the to the point. Like I'm I'm good. I'm slow to the line. <laughs> All right. Well, let's open it up. I know you guys have some questions. Hey, Andy. Hi. I'm, I'm over here. I wanted to know if. <laughs> What part of law school or prosecuting help, did you feel like helped you write the book or deal with people in the house? Um, deal with people in the house, definitely like interrogation skills. I mean, I was rapid fire questions. Like I had no problem putting these guys on the hot seat. Um, as far as writing the book, I mean, obviously, so I wrote the book. I figured when I had this idea for a book that we'd get a ghostwriter and my agent was like, uh, no, you're a lawyer. Like you can write the book. Um, and But it's funny, it actually... I, I used to write legal briefs and I had to kind of take myself out of that mode and like really feel what I was writing and just kind of irrationally, um, subconsciously write. So it, was, it kind of had like a, an alter effect. Um, I had to t step away from the legal legalese and write like from the heart more. Are you back in the legal world now, by the way? No, not, I, everyone asks me like, will you go back? I'm like, yeah, for sure. You know, I have that law degree, it's, it's waiting for me, but. No, for right now, I'm, I'm doing the book, and yeah, we'll see. Fun. Hi, Andy. Hi. I'm a huge fan. I read the book in three days. It was <laughs> awesome. Yes. Um, so when you're on The Bachelor and you're on the dates, all the food just sits there, and it looks amazing. <laughs> yes. Does anyone ever eat, or is, no, what do you do with all that great Nobody food? Eats. Okay, so we it's do nice. eat. We do not eat on camera. Everyone asks us. First of all, I don't think it's like pretty to eat on camera. They don't want to like see us scarfing down food, but the food is cold by the time you get to the date, because everyone's always running late, and you know, you'd be like eating ice-cold chicken, and it doesn't sound very appetizing. But we we do eat plenty on the, the show, I swear. <laughs> hey, Andy. Hi. Happy National Wine Day. <laughs> oh, it Thank is you. National Wine yes. Day. I felt like it was so ironic. <laughs> I'm um, buzzed already. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like 10 a.m. <laughs> Anyways, so you moved to New York after the show. Was that kind of part of 
the breaking up process, like you felt fresh start, kind yeah. of that type of thing? Absolutely. Um, people ask, you know, why did you move to New York? And I say a breakup. And they're like, no, why really? And I'm like, no, a breakup, seriously. Um, but yeah, I decided just, I was in Atlanta, my relationship had happened there, and it was like all these memories, and I just felt really stuck. Um, so I packed up my bags and said, kind of to hell with it, I'm just going to try something new. Um, greatest suggestion I could ever give to get a, getting over a breakup. Pick up and leave. Pick up and move somewhere and start fresh. Like, you can always find a job somewhere. You can always find friends. You know, you can make your life whatever you want. Um, but a fresh start is everything to me. We have time for one more. Oh, Amy. Mm -hmm. Hi. Pleasure to be here. You too. Uh, so, uh, what, 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 was, what was your pet, what was, what, what was your pet peeve of uh, a, a date and, and being in a relationship? Um, that absolutely drove you crazy. Good question. I feel like you're like getting some tips over here. Um, okay, pet peeves. You should listen to this. This is good advice from, from a girl. Pet peeves for a guy. Okay, if you're going on a date, first of all, don't you dare show up late. Always, you, you should be like five, ten minutes early. If you're driving, I used to say in the South, like, don't you dare honk your horn when you get in the driveway. And um, don't show up to the date drunk. That is a huge no-no. You would not believe how many guys like get nervous, and, like, and on the show, like, I'd be like, "You're showing up to the date, totally buzzed." Um, and I think for taking a girl out for the first date, just like be creative, pick a restaurant that just either is your favorite or has a cool vibe. Don't feel like you have to go through extremes. You don't need a helicopter. You don't need a palace. Trust me, <laughs> it clearly does not work. Um, but yeah, just be creative and be yourself. So pet peeves is tardiness from a guy. I can be late, though, just so you know. <laughs> this, this doesn't take, you know, just five minutes. <laughs> All right, one more. Hi. When you guys appeared together, like, literally three days before you broke up, mm -hmm. were you already broken up? Or, like, did you see it coming, know it was coming? Was that, like, incredibly awkward? I'm like, I feel like you have to read the book. Yeah. It's so good. I That's one of the you, things that you have to read. I want to tell you, but, like, the story of that, to me, is so good in the book. Because you were at the season premiere. No, you got to read it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of people had questions about that. No, it's your your question is so valid, and I think people were kind of like, wait, did they defraud us? Did they were they broken up? Was this like really sudden? But you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think if you read the book and especially that chapter, it makes a lot more sense. And it's all the way at the end. So happy. So reading. you have to happy reading, happy wine day. <laughs> Too bad it's not Friday. <laughs> well, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for being here, thank Andy. Thank you. Thank uh, you all. And good luck with the book. <laughs>